This game is rated M and is intended for mature audiences. Alright, we're back to the classroom, eh? That bell sounded like it was underwater. <laughs> oh boy, it's Michiru. As soon as the lecturer leaves the classroom, Michiru slumps forward and onto her desk. We've only gotten through two periods. Are you out of stamina already? Lectures are not the best way of teaching people, generally. What? <laughs> what the? <laughs> Sachi, wrong lead. <laughs> Michiru, bring your own pencils. <laughs> oh my gosh, really? That's quite the imaginative leap in logic there. And then Amine is just sitting back in laughing, which I I, I can get that. <laughs> so Chiru Chiru is apparently mocking his nickname for Michiru, eh? Sachi hands Michiru a new lead for her mechanical pencil. <laughs> Yeah, yes, Sachi, that's what most people would want when they ask for lead. Wow. You just put yourself down. Also, why is Yumiko actually being kind of, like, social? Wow! How is she allowed to do this? Way to prove her right. What? <laughs> Sachi understood that? <laughs> What? Getting disturbed. I'm willing to bet she saw some spy movie yesterday. Well, I would like to forget that. But anyway, you've really got the work, Sachi. What? You're a unique one. <laughs> oh, she's embarrassed. Let's see, do you have a chisel on hand as well? As soon as I requested, a chisel set emerges from the depths of her desk. What? How about a heavy-duty stapler that can handle dozens of sheets of paper at once? Standing from her desk, Sachi walks off to face a large locker in the back of the classroom. What's with that locker? It's twice the size of the others. Is Sachi just the girl who has everything? Within a few minutes, she finds the requested item and brings it to me. Normally, I'd expect to have to go to a stationery store to get something like this. Probably not. Hmm? <laughs> uh, you've gotta love Michiru's facial expressions. Are you saying that her karate chop cuts sharper than a folding blade? Yeah, literally everybody in some way is completely lacking in basic social skills. 
I see. Well, considering her apparent skill and devotion, I suppose she's well prepared to deal with m most requests. <laughs> We're getting a flashback. Why are they still wearing short sleeves if it's this cold? Oh, that's kind of mean. Oh, it's a heat wave. うん。見直した、見直した。わお。というわけでさち、鍋セットの用意は任せたわよ。はい、わかりました。なんて、さすがに鍋は無理よね。で、あれ。さっちゃん、どこ行ったんだろう。鍋をやるために必要なものを集め
Okay, this looks about right. With a careful check of the bamboo flume that makes up the small canal, I've confirmed that the water is flowing smoothly. Having explained the gist of things to the others, I spend the last two periods obtaining the necessary materials and putting together a simple angled bamboo gutter on the roof. You know, like, as you do. A few minutes after lunch break begins, my classmates, excluding Sachi, emerge. Yeah, there's a bamboo grove within walking distance to the direction of the mountain, so the materials weren't hard to come by. To be fair, that could be a good use of skipping class time. This would be the first time I've skipped class, come to think of it. No, I'm a good student. Yeah, I suppose you could say that. Also, I used Mozo Bamboo for this vein, but when you're looking to make more intricate goods like a hamper or a strainer, the more flexible Madake Bamboo is better suited to the job. If you can, if you can tell the difference between the two, it'll come in handy when you're trying to live off of the mountains. Keep it in mind. Yeah, You never know, but you're probably right. So, Sachi joins us, carrying a large tote bag on her shoulder. Or tote bag. Whoops. Sachi, nice timing, Looks like you were able to find what we needed. Then let's start preparing for the meal. <laughs> okay, the Michiru smile is pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I freaking love Michiru's sprites. It's so good. <laughs> She's a. <like, laughs> Oh my... <sighs> Yumiko, your gimmick is really not good. They're kaha Oh, Yumiko. What a character. After I distribute a pair of chopsticks and a bowl of soup for the noodles to everyone, they take up their desired positions around the bamboo gutter. I don't have a paintbrush, bro. They're too expensive, you know. It seems like flowing soman is a rare experience for everyone, not just me. Besides, I'm not an artist. I'm art. E. In response to Michiru's yell, Sachi releases a few strands of soma noodles into the waterway. stream. Okay, apparently, like, literally, you can say any word and people will interpret it as a sex joke. That's not the way my mind works. <laughs> like, if you say paintbrush, the vast majority of people are not going to interpret that as something lewd. They're going to interpret that as, well, a paintbrush. <laughs> Hold on, you all have to take turns eating. Wow, is that the first time Yumiko has really smiled a real smile? I 
I have no idea what's even happening anymore in the game. Amine and Makina stir their empty soup bowls with hollow eyes. Because of the intense battle upstream, none of the noodles have reached their lower position. Alright, then we'll just do this. I set up another gutter that I prepared as a spare at a position below Michiru. Sachi, let's get some in this one as well. I have literally no idea what's happening. No need to thank me. A long time ago I had it beaten into me to not waste the things I make. Hopefully not literally beaten into you. <laughs> Sachi looks ticked! I glance to my side where Sachi is silently floating soma noodles down the waterway. At this rate, you're not going to get any, Sachi. Alright, I'll secure your share. Scooby noodles directly from the original container, I deposit them in Sachi's bowl. <laughs> I like the little blush, though. She's the one who got, went to all the trouble to get the stuff! Not happening. A pair of observant hunters are on me in seconds. Hold it. If everyone starts taking noodles directly, it's not flowing, Soman. Ew, no. That is so gross. Sexy Soman. Nice ring to it. That holds zero appeal. No, 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 no. <laughs> yes, Michiru! Exactly! What is wrong with them? <laughs> okay, no, it's official. This is the. Oh my gosh, that's actually terrifying. <laughs> she's. These parts. It looks like she's got blood bursting out of the sides of her eyes. That's actually kind of scary. Welcome, Vosa. Yeah, um. Yeah, oh, this is turning so nasty. Oh. Like, is this is this game going to eventually get a story? <laughs> oh, sorry we didn't invite you, Principal. <laughs> the Principal knows it's a game. Alright, we're back to the hallway. I have heard it takes about three days to get a cat to uh, take to you. The girl named Irisu Makina got attached to me even faster than that. Yes, this is the same Akana who used to flee the instant she laid eyes on me. I have no idea what changed her mind, but lately it's been quite the opposite, with her approaching me on sight. Oh, so so she used to be constantly avoiding us, now she's just a attached herself, eh? <laughs> yeah, true. Not that she's particularly talkative, after a small greeting she tends to just tag along in silence. You want something? Honestly speaking, getting followed around for no reason like this is a little annoying. That said, there's no reason for me to coldly shoo her away, either. You don't need to go to afternoon class? I see. In other words, she's probably just bored. Who's my best girl so far? Definitely Sachi. Like, not even close. Having said that, though, my, my second... I can't believe I'm about to say this, but number two is probably the Sundere Michiru. Because at least she's super entertaining. <laughs> it's not rare for a few of my classmates to be lazing around by the vending machines after lunch. If you've got nothing to do, how about going back to the dorm and studying? It is what I'd like to say, but come to think of it, I'm also wandering around wasting my free fifth period. Guess I don't exactly have the right to lecture Makina. Want something to drink? I dig my hand around in my pockets, searching for a small change. <laughs> Holding out her right palm toward me to declare, it's fine, Makina takes out something that looks like a green stuffed animal from her pocket. The vaguely frog-shaped thing seems to be a purse, as its red mouth opens wide with a snap of metal bearings. It's a frogger purse that is loaded with 220s. After taking out a few coins, Makina buys a juice box from one of the vending machines, lined up in the passage, then returns to my side. 
pulling the attached straw free with stubby, clumsily-looking fingers, Magna pierces it into the juice box and starts to slurp up the contents. Similarly, I drink quietly from my paper cup full of oolong tea. These are very different from American vending machines. Like, American drink machines, like, do you want, uh, Mountain Dew, Coke, Coke Zero, Diet Coke, Cherry Coke, Diet Vanilla Cherry Coke, or maybe Sprite? Oh, and I guess we have Aquafina. True. Now we're repeating ourselves. Probably evidence that we're both puzzled over how to get a conversation started. That can be tough! <laughs> Especially... <laughs> I'm someone who's generally pretty introverted and doesn't make a whole lot of conversation, so if I'm with someone who's similar, it's very tough to have a conversation. Who was it who told me that the man has to break the ice in situations like this? Of course, I'm not confident I could pull it off as if I tried. What do I talk about with a girl like Makina? Stories. Hmm, stories. It's a fairly standard request, but I'm not sure where to go with this. What sort of story? <laughs> Have you heard the story of how the Grinch stole Christmas? A cool story. Hmm. That's a bit tricky. When you're looking for a chilling tale, I think ghost stories are the standard choice. Fortunately, I'm not lacking in that department. A legacy of the time I spent at my old school. This sounds like a darker school than Phoebe's old school on Magic School Bus. Alright then. This is something I heard from an upperclassman at my previous school. Another flashback? This is the story of an American soldier who found himself on a southern island in a night flooded with lukewarm rain. The soldier was making his way south through the darkened jungle amid the pelting downpour, following a native trail with eight companions. Their objective was an enemy anti-aircraft position. The rain had been falling for two days straight, leaving the ground swampy as a paddy field. With the moon hidden by thick storm clouds, the soldiers couldn't even see the back of the comrade walking two or three meters ahead. The squad's nerves were already worn by the suggestive darkness of the night jungle, but the relentless rain pierced through the tree canopy and was slowly sapping their endurance as well. Does this, like, have anything to do with the actual game? And on top of it all, the rough map they'd received from the scouts was vague to the point of uselessness. Good for a little, but enough further fueling their anxiety. As the squad trudged on at the virtual crawl through the knee-deep mud, it was inevitable that their formation grew increasingly loose. So the American soldier, a sniper bringing up the rear of the column, was desperately struggling to avoid getting separated from the rest of his unit. Eventually, he heard a distinctive clacking from the some distance in front of him, rising above the sound of the rain. He recognized the sound as the castanets of the platoon leader, carried as a means to communicate at night, or in poor visibility conditions where hand signals were impractical. The number of times he clacked indicated an order to halt on the spot. The man dropped to one knee in the muddy water, grasped his rifle to his breast, and removed the lens cap from his scope, shielding it from the rain. An enemy ambush? Lying flat on the spot, the man pressed his strong eye against the gun's sight. The back of the soldier in front of him came into view. No shots had been fired as of yet. Earlier reconnaissance had indicated that there were barely any enemy troops or armed guerrillas in the area. If there were enemies here, the odds are that they would be scouts, and most likely a fairly small group. As the man rested his chin in the muddy water to watch the jungle ahead, he for heard the first sounds of gunfire. The enemy wasn't even 30 feet meters away from his squad. They'd practically bumped into each other. Six lines of fire from the enemy position. Just as he'd fought, it seemed to be a small scouting group. Judging from the reckless way they opened fire blindly, they were probably poorly trained guerrillas who'd panicked after encountering their enemy under these unusual conditions. Removing his gaze from the scope, the man grasped his weapon and pulled back the bolt handle. Pushing a 7.62mm bullet into the exposed chamber, he quickly returned his dominant eye to the eye cup of his sight. This seems very unnecessary. The muzzle flash is visible through the scope bur bu uh, burned white after images on his to his pupil, fully dilated after his long walk into the darkness. He couldn't see the enemy. Aiming on intuition alone, he squeezed the trigger. A momentary explosion of light from his gun, and he heard the enemy's grunt from the bush some 30 meters away. A hit. The man took his rifle in both hands and began to crawl on his elbows and knees in search of a new firing position. After moving the ten meters to his left, he discovered a convenient foxhole that would serve his purpose nicely. When he swung his body down into the hole, he found it was half full of stagnant water, just as he'd expected. But that fact barely registered in his mind. More importantly, from a position like this, he could snipe while hidden for a time. Sunk to the waist in the muddy water, he mechanically pulled back his rifle's bolt and squeezed the trigger, again and again and again. 
All of a sudden, he heard a voice from the next foxhole. Since when had it been occupied? Hey, give me a grenade! In response, the man took an M67 grenade from a belt swung around his waist and held it out, the safety pin still fixed in place. A white hand reached out from the nearby trench and received it. Thank you. The man was certain he had heard those words. But no matter how long the man waited, his comrade didn't throw the grenade. Maybe the safety pin was bent somehow and he couldn't get it loose? Hey, you okay? As the man was speaking those words, he started to move his head to look at the edge of the encampment. At that moment, the grenade exploded in the next foxhole. Yeah. An explosion at point-blank range isn't something you hear. The overpowering waves of sound aren't recognized by your ears as noise. A mass of burning air struck the man like a wall, knocking his helmet off his head and thrusting his body backward into the muddy hole. His mouth, thrown open by the explosion, was instantly filled with filthy water. As the man desperately tried to spit it out, he realized his tongue had been knocked back into his throat. He couldn't breathe. Quickly thrusting his hands into his mouth, the man peeled his ton free with his fingers and powerfully vomited out the water together with the breath that he had gathered in his lungs. <coughs> his throat was burning from inhaling the explosion's scorching wind, and he couldn't stop the tears that were pouring down his face. I'm surprised he's still alive. His head felt like he had taken a direct hit from a fastball made of concrete, and his ears were filled with a high-pitched ringing. Hey, you all right? Get it together! Curled up in the muddy water with his head in his hands, the man heard the voice of a comrade. At least his eardrums hadn't shattered. He felt himself being dragged out from the foxhole by both arms. We've got to move! Temporary withdrawal! Can you walk? It took all of the man's effort to nod his head. He couldn't see. His ears were barely functional. And his throat was on fire. He couldn't even speak. The man began to ran run with his hand across the hit ground in a panic. His comrade knew what he was looking for. The man felt his rifle pressed it back into his hands. Reassured by the familiar feel of his weapon, the man swung it onto his shoulder. His hands still clutching the ground, he fled that place at a crawl. Does this story, like, have a meaning? I don't know why we were getting this massive sidetrack. Had 30 minutes passed, when the man came to himself, the rain had, ironically enough, finally stopped. His vision had largely, re largely recovered. When he looked around, he saw his companions, all just as filthy with mud. Hey, Shorty! You still alive? The sniper was still scurrying along the ground when that voice called to him. It belonged to a black man who'd joined the army at the same time as him. They'd been in the same squad in their training days as well, and the black man was his closest friend in the platoon. His greeting was casual, as always. Give me a break. The man reshouldered his beloved rifle and told his friend about the hand grenade accident. That voice from the next foxhole, the grenade he handed over in response, moments later, the explosion. The man angrily spat out the details of his brush with death for the never's stupidity. The black man listened in silence. When the story was over, after a brief pause, he finally spoke. Huh? The hell are you talking about, Shorty? The black man said his story was impossible. Come to think of it, of course it was. The man was the unit's bird man, the rear guard, the end of the line. Usually, the bird man marched 10 to 20 meters behind the squad. There was no way an ally would have encamped only 2 or 3 meters from his position. Even considering his movements to change his firing position, he couldn't have met anyone until the unit broke out into a retreat. I mean, let's say you're right and some jackass dropped a grenade into his own foxhole. Okay, who was that? When the man looked around his surroundings, all eight of the squad's other members were accounted for. A few were lightly wounded, but clearly none of them had been on the receiving end of a grenade blast recently. So, who the hell did you give that grenade to? In response to his friend's words, a shiver ran through the man's spine. After rejoining the main force and completing his report, the man told his story to a grizzled veteran. The sergeant major had an explanation of sorts for him. That place is right around the site of an old battle where many Americans died. Among them were many wounded who had been cruelly, slowly butchered by the guerrillas with spears and bayonets, and some who had reached the grenades on their waist and pulled out the pin rather than be tortured to death. So in the end, who had taken the man's grenade? Perhaps a lingering spirit still clinging to the battlefield even in death. Or so the story went. What do you think? Get a bit of a chill? <laughs> okay, that last part was TMI. Oh, sorry about that. Forget it. <laughs> oh no! She's like your six year old niece, basically. It's my bad. <laughs> huh? Yeah, got it. Makina throws her empty juice box into a trash can and starts to patter away. As usual, she leaves as quickly as she arrives. 
But this time, after walking about three meters, Makina stops on the spot and turns back to me. Hmm? What? Life after death? Hmm. Can't say for sure, since I've never experienced it firsthand. If you believe in it, then maybe there is. In the army, there's a popular story about an afterlife exclusively for soldiers. It's a story you'll find in the armed forces of pretty much any country, in pretty much identical form. If you believe an afterlife is waiting for you, it will be. I'm sure it's something like that. I, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not saying afterlife doesn't make sense, I'm saying that afterlife existing only if you believe in it makes sense. Either it does or it doesn't. With those words, she runs off, this time without looking back. I don't think I said anything particularly interesting, but hearing words of thanks naturally lightens my mood anyway. Drinking up the remaining Ulan tea with a gulp, I throw the empty cup in a trash bin and walk off toward our classroom for the sixth period class. <laughs>